All right, we'll go ahead and get started with our next uh, speaker. So we have Lauren Willoughby. She's a physician assistant with our program, uh, primarily practicing in the inpatient unit um, for the last several years. Uh, Lauren is also a Colorado native. Um, and um, she attended, uh, attended undergrad at Colorado State University, uh, where she graduated with a bachelor's degree in health and exercise science. She was accepted to the CUPA program, and after graduation, started her first job with us, as I mentioned. Lauren has a particular interest in allogeneic stem cell transplant and infectious disease. In her free time, Lauren enjoys hiking with her husband and dog, playing tennis, and cooking. So um, please welcome Lauren Willoughby for her talk on allogeneic stem cell transplant. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Lauren. Um, as Glenn mentioned, I have been working inpatient in the bone marrow transplant group for about three years. Um, and I've always found myself really interested in allogeneic stem cell transplant. So I'm excited to talk about it today. So just a brief overview of the objectives of this presentation. Um, goal is to understand the role of allogeneic stem cell transplant to summarize the basics of stem cell transplant medicine including HLA matching, donor sources, and conditioning regimens, and then to identify complications of allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, I have no financial relationships to disclose. So we'll start off with a case study. This is Gertrude. She's a 67-year-old female with high-risk AML. She's now in remission following one cycle of azacitidine and venetoclax. She needs further treatment to consolidate her remission, otherwise the likelihood of relapse is high. So she is under evaluation for allogeneic stem cell transplant. Just a brief overview of what allogeneic stem cell transplant really is. It's the transplant of a donor's stem cells into a patient in order to reconstitute hematopoiesis and the immune system. Looking at it in a very basic manner, it's the collection and processing of a donor cells, um, giving the patient high-dose conditioning chemotherapy, followed by the infusion of donor stem cells, and then awaiting engraftment or waiting for those cells to um, proliferate and grow. And this is a kind of a stepped back, like zoomed out version of the tr typical transplant course. It follows the patient from diagnosis to the post-transplant phase. Um, so this is a newly diagnosed AML patient, like our patient, Miss Gertrude. Um, she has already undergone her pre-transplant treatment in order to achieve remission. Um, this has to be followed by pre-transplant testing and evaluating for measurable residual disease. Um, happening in the background while patients are getting their uh, remission or their um, induction chemotherapy is the search for an appropriate donor. Um, when the patient admits for transplant, that's when they get this conditioning regimen of the high-dose chemotherapy, on average about five days of chemotherapy. Um, day zero is when we infuse the stem cells. And then the post-transplant period is really focused on prevention of infections, evaluating and preventing graft-versus-host disease, um, and monitoring for disease recurrent post stem cell transplant. Um, at this point in time, if patients are having waning graft function or um, not ideal function of their graft post transplant, we can consider an additional stem cell boost or donor lymphocyte infusion. And we can also consider for patients that have high risk disease or are going into transplant with MRD positive disease could consider some sort of maintenance, targeted maintenance therapy post transplant. So the indication for transplant varies by disease status. It's a very common treatment for leukemia, including AML and ALL, high-risk MDS, aplastic anemia, CML, especially those in blast phase or refractory to TKIs, and lymphoma, and particularly in the relapsed or refractory cases. Giving these stem cells allows us to give more intensive treatment. Um, the stem cell, the infusion of stem cells really enables us to overcome the dose limiting toxicity of high doses of chemotherapy and radiation. And then um, the stem cells also provide a graft first leukemia or graft first tumor effect. And um, this is how we think transplants actually cure people. These donor cells continue to eliminate residual leukemia cells after allogeneic stem cell transplant. Evaluation for transplants is a very complicated process. Um, eligibility is highly individualized. It varies with patient age, 
fitness status, comorbidities, and social supports. Transplant evaluation is performed by a team of transplant physicians and coordinators, nurses, psychologists, and social workers. So to evaluate disease status, this is typically done by a pre-transplant bone marrow biopsy and lumbar puncture. If the patient had prior extramedullary disease or central nervous system involvement, we will repeat imaging with a PET scan or some sort of central nervous system imaging might be indicated. Generally, we prefer patient disease to be in a complete remission um, prior to proceeding with transplant. But um, as Alex had previously mentioned, this factor of measurable residual disease, this is the persistence of disease uh, below the typical diagnostic testing of morphologic review. So patients can be considered in a morphologic remission, but still have measurable residual disease. This is typically detected by FISH, high sensitivity flow cytometry, and molecular testing. So the role of measurable residual disease is very important prior to transplant. Although patients are able to proceed if they're MRD positive, the risk of relapse post-transplant is much higher. This graph is demonstrating patients that are MRD negative prior to transplant compared to MRD positive, um, as well as active disease. And on the left is overall survival. On the right is showing leukemia-free survival. Um, and as we can see in both circumstances, MRD patients have a much higher percentage of survival following transplant compared to those that are MRD positive. Other things we need to evaluate prior to transplant is the patient's general organ function. Um, renal function is very important. Patients that have baseline renal dysfunction um, have an increased risk of transplanted related adverse effects. Many transplant centers prefer patients to have a serum creatinine under two or creatinine clearance over 50. There are many nephrotoxic medications involved in stem cell transplant like the immunosuppression um, for, for GBHD prevention. And there's also other possible renal insults throughout the transplant process, like as one example, hypotension related to sepsis. Cardiac function is also very important to evaluate. Um, we prefer a left ventricular ejection fraction over 35%. And although it's uncommon to have life-threatening um, cardiac complications, their transplant process can cause subacute cardiac injury, um, even in patients that have a normal pre-transplant cardiac function. And so this subacute injury is much likely, uh, much more likely to have a greater impact in patients that are starting out with a lower cardiac reserve. Um, all of our patients get pulmonary function testing prior to transplant. Uh, Pre-existent lung disease is associated with inferior transplant outcomes. And then hepatic function is also very important to consider. Patients with frank cirrhosis of the liver are typically excluded from allogeneic stem cell transplant due to excessive morbidity and mortality. A few other things we have to consider, age. Um, there's no specific age cutoff that's universally used. Younger patients in general are able to tolerate more aggressive conditioning. However, since the recognition of graft versus leukemia, we are able to transplant up to 70 to 80 year old patients, pending their comorbidities, of course. Um, and this uh, allows, the recognition of graft versus leukemia allows for us to use less intensive conditioning because we know those stem cells will continue to fight off the leukemia following transplant. Performance status is also helpful to assess just relative fitness status of our patients and transplant-related mortality risk. At our center, we typically use the Karnofsky performance status. Infectious screening and history, um, we screen patients for active and latent infections and past and current exposures. This helps us to determine the risk of infection and creates a personalized treatment plan. And psychological and social support is a huge factor that plays into stem cell transplant. Um, going through transplant is no small feat. It creates a lot of uh, psychological and financial pressures for patients and their families. Um, just one example, patients often need to relocate to within 30 miles of the hospital and have a full-time live-in caregiver through day plus 100. Um, so making sure the appropriate social and financial supports as best we can are in place prior to transplant really helps with our patient success. So now going into the process of finding a donor. I wouldn't really be able to talk about this without first going into HLA matching. So human leukocyte and antigen matching is an essential component of allogeneic stem cell transplant. It's the process of evaluating an HLA, a recipient HLA genotype and searching for a donor that has matched alleles. HLA is a system of closely linked genes on chromosome six, and they code for membrane proteins that present antigens to T cells. And it helps to distinguish the immune system, it helps the immune system distinguish from self from non-self. 
The HLA system is the most polymorphic genetic region known in the human genome, and this means that they have many different alleles for each gene. So every person has two sets of HLA called haplotypes. They get one set from their father and one set from their mother. Siblings from the same parents um, have a 25% percent chance of being a full match to one another. Um, as we can see on the diagram on the right, our patient um, has inherited one red and one dark blue from their parents. Um, and unfortunately, they, they do not have any full matches in their siblings. Um, so one of the next places we can look for a related donor is a haploidentical donor. This is a patient that shares just one haplotype um, with their donor, and this is available to most recipients. There's a 50% chance you'll have one in your siblings, and all of the children and parents of the patient will be haplotype donors. So what does it mean to be fully matched? HLA genes that are relevant to the transplant process include HLA A, B, C, DR, and DQ. Um, a perfect match is now considered a 10 out of 10 HLA match. This refers to donor-recipient pairs that are perfect matches at the allele level at all five of those gene sites. Um, we can also have mis mismatched related or unrelated donors, and that would be a mismatch at any one of those um, five genes. So it could be a five, nine out of 10 match, for example. Um, and then we already kind of mentioned this, but the haploidentical donor is a donor who shares by common inheritance exactly one HLA haplotype with the recipient and is a mismatch for a variable number of HLA genes on the unshared haplotype. So going into types of stem cell transplants, our patient is here in the red. Um, so again, the chance of finding a match-related donor, it's the, our first choice, but only a 25% um, chance in patients that have siblings. Um, next, we typically look at a matched unrelated donor or mismatched unrelated donor. This is that be the match um, bone marrow registry. And then another possible source is cord blood. This is blood derived from the placenta and umbilical cord at the time of birth. There's a large bank that's available um, for transplant centers to look at in order to find a match. And then again, going into um, if none of these are felt to be a good option for the patient, haploidentical donors are pretty readily available. So continuing on, as I mentioned, match-related donor is almost always the first choice. However, less than one-third of patients will have this option. And although it's typically the first choice, um, some circumstances might make a related donor less desirable compared to alternative donor sources. Um, like older age, if we're in the scenario of transplanting a maybe 75-year-old patient, we might not want their match-related brother who's 80, um, so might look for alternative donor sources. Um, and this I just found interesting. You would think identical twin donors might be a perfect option. Um, they're a perfect match to one another. They don't need any immunosuppression and don't develop graft-versus-host disease um, following transplant, but they do have a very high risk of relapse, and this is due to the impaired donor lymphocyte ability to recognize those recipient tumor cells. Um, so yeah, the immune systems are just too similar and we lose that graft versus leukemia effect. Next best choice typically that we look for if patients don't have a match related donor is a matched unrelated donor. Again, this is the be the match registry. However, ethnicity plays a huge factor in how likely you are to find a donor. Most donors are from North America and Europe. The lowest probability of finding a match if you're of African descent, highest if, of your, if you're of European descent, it's about 16% and 75% respectively. If you are lucky enough to have a donor through this um, method, they have similar outcomes to a match-related donor. And this graph is just representing odds of finding a match through one of these um, registries by ethnicity. As you can see, white European far exceeds pretty much everybody else. Moving on to other um, donor sources, haploidentical donors. Again, this can be a parent, child, or sibling. Um, previously, due to the high degree of HLA match, these um, types of transplants were too high risk due to really high rates of graft-versus-host disease and graft failure, but is now possible and becoming much more popular with improvements in transplant medicine, um, mostly post-transplant cyclophosphamide, um, which we'll talk about a bit later. And patients that um, receive a haploidentical transplant with PTSI have similar outcomes to match unrelated trans um, donor transplants. We can also look at mismatch related or unrelated donors. This would be like a single antigen um, or allele mismatch or any of the gene sites. Um, 
and notably also with the use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, the HLA disparity found in unrelated donors does not seem to affect outcomes. And then again, cord blood, this is widely available. It's convenient to use due to less stringent matching requirements. They have decreased rates of graft-versus-host disease um, related to less T cells, but also having immunologically naive T cells that have not been exposed to prior infections. All of this uh, makes them more tolerant of tissue, tissue mismatch between donor and recipient. However, some of the drawbacks include a higher risk of graft failure, longer time to engraftment, which increase, um, which um, results in an increased risk of infection, and also does not allow for additional grafts for the same donor if needed, like if patients are having waning graft function and need a stem cell boost, it's not an option if they received a cord blood transplant. So this is a, a graphical representation of allo transplant types by year at CSU. Um, as you can see, match-related donor has been very popular since we've started doing transplants. Um, here at our center, we have also done a lot of cord transplants, um, which is represented by the white bars. Um, but since about 2016, you can see the increasing popularity of haploidentical and haplocord transplants. Um, and this is related to the use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide allowing us to do this. And then this is just a comparison of um, allogenic transplants in the US by donor type. Uh, matched unrelated donor is the um, highest proportion um, compared, followed by haploidentical transplants now taking second place and match related donor in third with um, a lower incidence of cord blood and mismatched unrelated donor overall. So beyond just HLA matching, disease status prior to transplant also heavily impacts transplant prognosis. So as we know, increased HLA disparity is associated with worse patient outcomes post stem cell transplant, but delays in time to transplant are also associated with worse patient outcomes. So the graph on the right is representing this pretty well. This is comparing patient survival and different degrees of HLA mismatch, but from top to bottom is showing it um, more progressive stages of disease. So the top is early stage disease, B is intermediate stage disease, and C is advanced stage disease. Um, the key takeaway from this is an eight out of eight HLA matched donor um, at three and five years post transplant, the rate for survival for early stage disease is closer to 50% at three and five years compared to somewhere in the mid 20s for late stage disease. So this is just a good representation that if the risk of relapse is high and the chance of finding a perfect match is low, then it might be preferable to proceed with a known mismatch or alternative donor source like a haploidentical transplant or a cord. Um, for these patients. Also important to consider beyond who we get the stem cells from is also where we get the stem cells from. So um, there's three main places we can acquire stem cells. Um, that is peripheral blood, bone marrow, and then umbilical cord blood. For peripheral blood, this is the collection of stem cells from peripheral circulation after mobilization. This is preferred for adult patients undergoing stem cell transplant for malignancy. Compared to bone marrow, peripheral blood grafts are associated with comparable or better survival and fewer rates of relapse. The pros include a better yield of stem cells, which leads to faster engraftment. However, we also get more T cells with this collection method, so um, patients can have more chronic graft versus host disease. For bone marrow, um, this is the direct aspiration of bone marrow aspirate under anesthesia. This is preferred for patients undergoing allo stem cell transplant for non-malignant disorders. And in our, at our center, um, that's typically aplastic anemia. Um, compared to peripheral blood, bone marrow had comparable or better survival and less graft versus host disease related to the lower T cell content. Um, and this is acceptable for these non-malignant patients because we don't need that graft versus tumor effect. Um, so we just wanna minimize the risk of graft versus host disease as best we can. Um, and then again, talking a bit about cord blood patients, uh, this is the blood remaining in umbilical cord and placenta following birth. The pros include an expanded donor pool, ease of procurement, and decreased rates of graft versus host disease. Cons include increased risk of graft failure, delayed immune reconstitution, and unavailability of the donor for additional donation. Now switching gears to think a little bit about conditioning regimens. These include a combination of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and sometimes immunotherapeutic agents. Um, the purpose of giving this treatment prior to infusion of stem cells is to reduce the disease burden of underlying malignancy and also to provide sufficient myelosuppression to prevent rejection of the graft when we do infuse those stem cells. 
This is, I think, an older graph, but it does a good job of representing the wide spectrum of conditioning regimens that we can give patients. Um, looking over on the right are non-myoblative conditioning regimens. These um, do not typically, or they do not fully abolish the host cells. So initially, um, this will result in a chimeric state where we're having both donor and host hematopoiesis occurring at the same time. And it relies heavily on the graft versus leukemia effect um, for, and we are hoping that the donor cells will eventually take over um, all of the host hematopoiesis and fully eliminate the, any residual leukemia um, from our patient. This is typically reserved for older patients um, over 60 to 75 years old or patients that have comorbidities that preclude them from getting more intensive treatment. Looking at the myeloablative side of our graph, um, this, will, this is a very intense treatment. It eliminates nearly all host bone marrow cells and it causes pancytopenia that's irreversible unless hematopoiesis is restored by stem cells. This is typically reserved for our younger patients, like under 55 years old, and fit patients that are able to tolerate these very intensive treatments. And then somewhere in the middle is reduced intensity. Um, this is not quite as um, harmful as the myeloablative um, conditioning regimens, but it will still cause cy cytopenias that are prolonged, and they do require stem cell support to restore hematopoiesis. Key points about conditioning regimens, less intensive conditioning is, a so, is better tolerated, but carries a higher risk of relapse. More intensive conditioning is associated with more adverse effects, but overall lower risk of relapse. And factors that influence our choice of conditioning regimens include disease status, age, and fitness level. And then we think a lot about T cells in stem cell transplant. Um, having a appropriate balance of them is pretty crucial. When we have too many T cells, um, this has an increased risk of graft versus host disease. Alternatively, too few T cells results in a loss of that graft versus leukemia effect and higher risk of relapse, higher risk of graft failure. And the exact mechanism of this is not well known, um, but it's probably related to some residual host T cells that have escaped myeloablation and are attacking the graft. And also um, too few T cells results in delayed immune reconstitution and can result in a higher risk of viral reactivation. So ideally we want selective, de selective depletion of T cells um, to be able to reduce graft versus host disease without impairing the graft versus leukemia effect. So catching back up with Gertrude, she's relatively healthy outside of her AML diagnosis. She has no significant comorbidities and lives an active lifestyle. She does not have any, any siblings, but does have a daughter who is a haploidentical match. So the decision was made to proceed with the haploidentical stem cell transplant with Thiotepa 5, Busulfan 6, Fludarabine 150 with post-transplant cyclophosphamide. This is a reduced intensity conditioning regimen given her age over 60 years old. So now turning our attention to complications of stem cell transplants. First, I just want to talk a bit about toxicities related to the conditioning chemotherapy. These are typically very high doses of chemotherapy and cause some pretty predictable side effects. Mucositis is very common. Patients, uh, this is inflammation of mucus, the mucous membranes. It can be very severe and it's worse with myeloablative conditioning and high dose radiation. Generally, these symptoms don't improve until their cell counts start to recover, so it can be pretty persistent for a couple of weeks. Management is focused on supportive care, including pain control, um, sometimes requires the patient controlled analgesia, changing oral meds to IV, and then supplemental nutrition. Nausea and vomiting is also very common. Antiemetics are built into the treatment plans throughout conditioning, but pending the severity of symptoms, patient may, patients may require additional scheduled IV antiemetics. And diarrhea is also very common. Um, we always like to rule out infection but we can consider alternative causes like graft versus host disease if the diarrhea is persistent or worsening after patient cell counts have come in, medication side effects, non-oral mucositis, and typhlitis. If the diarrhea is found to be non-infectious, we can typically support with anti-diarrheals. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about less common but more severe complications of stem cell transplants. This includes sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, also known as veno-occlusive disease. This is a systemic endothelial disease. It presents days to weeks following stem cell transplant. It does have the potential to rapidly progress to multi-organ dysfunction and death. 
However, the incidence in our adult patients is less than 5%. For patients that do progress to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, mortality rate um, can exceed over 80%. And the pathophysiology is thought to be related to a buildup of toxic metabolites from the conditioning regimen. This causes endothelial cell damage, um, which can lead to sinusoidal narrowing, sinusoidal blockage related to clot formation and prothrombotic changes. And at this point, patients can develop clinical symptoms, which we'll talk a bit um, in a couple of slides. And there's the potential to progress to multi-organ dysfunction, though not all of patients have the severe manifestation of disease. Risk factors, there's a lot of different things to think about in patients that are at risk of um, developing SOS or VOD. For patient factors, we think about pre-existent liver disease. So the risk of developing SOS is three to 10 times greater in patients with increased AST prior to transplant. Lung disease, which is thought to be related to a reduced diffusion capacity, less than 70% predicted. This may reflect pre-existing systemic endothelial cell damage and greater susceptibility to liver injury. And then other things that are important to consider are age, performance status, and underlying disease like leukemia is thought to have a higher risk. Transplant factors include myeloablative conditioning with certain alkylating agents like busulfan, cytarabine, and cyclophosphamide, high doses of radiation therapy, um, donor source is important to consider, like unrelated donors or mismatched donors. And then certain combinations of graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis, including seralmus with cyclophosphamide and total body radiation, or methotrexate and busulfan. Prior treatments are also really important to consider. Treatment with certain monoclonal antibodies, like gemtuzumab and inotuzumab, can confer up to a 20 times higher risk of developing SOS or VOD. And in my personal experience, only real clinical, clinically significant um, SOS and VOD that we've seen has been patients treated with one of these prior agents. So for clinical presentation, most patients will present with weight gain and edema starting three to six days after transplant. This is followed by firm, painful hepatomegaly with ascites and jaundice. Uh, dyspnea, tachypnea, and other evidence of volume overload may accompany renal, cardiac, or pulmonary dysfunction in patients with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. The earliest lab normality is typically refractory thrombocytopenia. This may precede other clinical findings. And most patients have an elevated serum, AST, and or ALK-FOS. Um, and hyperbilirubinemia is common, but typically develops later. Severe disease can be um, associated with the elevated PT, INR, or other measures of impaired hepatic function, and abnormal renal function is present in about 50% of patients. So for the diagnosis of SOS or VOD, um, any two of the following criteria post-stem cell transplant, including an elevated bilirubin over two, unexpected weight gain greater than 5% of their baseline pre-stem cell transplant weight, excessive platelet transfusions without a clear alternative explanation, tender hepatomegaly, ascites on exam or imaging, and then reversal of portal venous flow by Doppler ultrasound. This can also be diagnosed by biopsy or portal venous wedge pressure. However, these are often not feasible at the time point when we would be diagnosing patients with SOS or VOD due to them being still pancytopenic following transplant. So all of our stem cell recipients are um, monitored very closely for SOS or VOD throughout their admission, and they receive preventative ursodiol for the first 90 days following stem cell transplant. This reduces hydrophobic bile acid, which is thought to be toxic to hepatic parenchymal cells in patients undergoing stem cell transplant. And then in order to think about treatment, we have to first be able to classify patient symptoms and um, by severity. So we, uh, here at our institution, we classify patients either as mild, moderate, or severe, very severe. Uh, mild moderate is characterized by a longer onset of symptoms to diagnosis, a bilirubin under five, transaminases under five times upper limit of normal, a weight increase less than 10% of their pre-transplant baseline, and renal function less than 1.5 times their baseline. Um, for mild SOS, typically just supportive care. Um, we diurese patients to help with the volume overload and avoid further hepatotoxic medications. For patients that have very severe or severe or very severe disease, this is a shorter onset of symptoms to diagnosis, bilirubin over five, transaminase is over five times the upper limit of normal, weight increase over 10%, or renal dysfunction over 1.5 times baseline, 
The mainstay of treatment for severe, very severe SOS is urgent initiation of defibrotide. The mechanism of this is not well understood, but it may involve endothelial protection, restoration of the thrombofibrinolytic balance, and anti-inflammatory properties. Right, so now moving on to another uncommon but serious side effect following stem cell transplant, and this is transplant-associated thrombotic microangiopathy, or TATMA. It's a systemic disease characterized by endothelial cell activation, complement dysregulation, which results in the formation of platelet-rich thrombi and microvascular hemolytic anemia. The incidence of this is poorly defined. It ranges from 0.8% to 36%. And the, la uh, the la large range of incidents is thought to be related to the lack of consensus for diagnostic criteria. Um, patients who do develop TA, TMA have a significantly higher non-relapse mortality. And it does have the potential to present as, as self-limited disease. However, more than half of patients will progress to multi-organ dysfunction with mortality rates exceeding 50% at one year post-transplant. There's a lot of different things that can put patients at increased risk for TA, TMA, but I'll highlight some of the more common ones, including older age, prior transplant, myeloablative or busulfan-containing condition regimens, total body irradiation, calcineurin inhibitor use or mTOR inhibitor use, and many others. Um, most cases are diagnosed before day plus 100, but there is a median onset around day plus 30. So for the clinical presentation of TA, TMA, it is associated with new or worsening anemia, thrombocytopenia, refractory hypertension, that's out of proportion to steroid use or calcineurin inhibitor use, and is refractory to antihypertensive medications. Renal dysfunction, elevated creatinine is a late indicator, whereas proteinuria develops much earlier. Patients can also have altered mental status, headaches, seizures, um, and hallucinations. And then... Patients can also present with GI involvement. This can involve severe abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, ascites, or GI bleed. So um, this is our diagnostic criteria we use here at um, our, our institution. It's diagnosed either by biopsy-proven disease like kidney or GI biopsy, or you can have um, greater than or equal to four of the following criteria at 14 days, at, uh, within 14 days at two consecutive time points. So anemia and thrombocytopenia are two things that need a little additional um, definitions because it's very common post-transplant to have both anemia and thrombocytopenia. So for anemia, we define it as a failure to retrieve transfusion independence um, from red blood cells despite neutrophil engraftment, a hemoglobin decline from a patient's baseline by one gram per deciliter, or new onset transfusion independence. And for these patients, it's really important to rule out other causes of anemia, such as autoimmune hemolytic anemia or pure red cell aplasia. Thrombocytopenia is defined as failure to achieve platelet engraftment, higher than expected platelet transfusion needs, refractoriness to platelet transfusions, or 50% reduction or greater in baseline platelet count after full platelet engraftment. Patients can also have an elevated LDH, schistocytes on peripheral smear, hypertension defined as BP greater than 140 over 90, again, out of proportion to medications and refractory to treatment, um, an elevated serum C5B9 complex. This is related to that um, complement dysfunction that's seen in TATMA. And then proteinuria defined as greater than one milligram per milligram on a random urine, creatinine, urine protein to creatinine ratio. We also classify patients further into a high-risk category for TATMA, and that's defined as having an LDH greater than two times upper limit of normal, having concurrent grade two to four acute graft-versus-host disease or concurrent viral infections, having elevated the serum C5B9 um, complex, or having proteinuria or concurrent organ dysfunction. So the management of TATMA, in less severe cases, we can typically just withdraw the offending agent, which is thought to be the calcineurin inhibitor, and replace with seralimus or steroid plus celsept for further graft-versus-host disease prevention. The calcineurin inhibitor is thought to contribute to endothelial cell injury via direct cytotoxic damage and platelet aggregation, elevated one von Willebrand factor, and several other mechanisms. For more severe cases or cases that are refractory to just us withdrawing the calcineurin inhibitor, we can treat with ecolizumab. This is a monoclonal antibody that prevents the formation of that terminal C5B9 complex. 
And then just an important note, um, the pathophysiology of TATMA is different from TTP in that there's no depletion of the Adams TS13. Um, so there's not typically a role for therapeutic plasma exchange in these patients, in, except in very select cases. I don't think any talk about stem cell transplant would be complete without at least mentioning infections. <laughs> so um, the graph over here on the right goes through different periods post-transplant and the types of infections that you are at most risk for. During the pre-engraftment phase, patients are neutropenic. They have evidence of barrier breakdown like mucositis or central venous access devices in place. This is when patients are at the highest risk for bacterial infections. Um, also on high alert for candidal or mold infections, including aspergillus. And throughout this process, patients are at risk for HSV, as well as respiratory and enteric viruses. Moving past the engraftment phase and into phase two, you know, now have neutrophils, which is great, but still have impaired cellular and humoral immunity. Patients' um, immune reconstitution is um, doesn't come back all at once. It develops over, you know, course of months to years following stem cell transplant. Um, so at this point, patients are at higher risk for viral reactivation like CMV, HHV6, or EBV, um, and still at risk for um, candidal and mold infections, as well as pneumocystis. And then even further on in the transplant period in the late phase, um, ongoing impaired cellular and humoral immunity um, there is an increased risk, again, of bacterial infections. We see VZV reactivation at this time and um, asper, at, again, at a higher risk of mold infections and ongoing risk of pneumocystis. Um, and there's kind of a bimodal distribution of bacterial infection and mold infections post-transplant. And this is related to patients that receive or develop graft-versus-host disease and have to be on higher doses of um, immune suppression following stem cell transplant. So for our approach to infections post-transplant is all about prevention. We give all of our patients acyclovir until after they receive their shingles vaccine or if they received a cord blood transplant, which is associated with that delayed immune reconstitution, will continue even after they've been vaccinated through five years post-transplant. Um, fluconazole or an alternative mold active agent, if they have a history of mold infections or prolonged neutropenia prior to transplant, will be continued through day plus 100. And Levaquin is given throughout neutropenia. We give our patients PJP prophylaxis through one year. And then Latermavir is special prophylaxis for CMV patients. Um, and so that's given in select cases as well. All right, so now talking a bit about graft versus host disease. Um, this is the donor T cells attacking the host. It's characterized by acute and chronic graft versus host disease. Acute graft versus host disease is characterized by maculopapular rash, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and rising serum bilirubin. The onset's less than 100 days post-stem cell transplant with a median onset around day plus 30, day plus 40. And then chronic G um, GVHD, this can involve nearly every organ system, um, including skin, mouth, liver, which is um, found to be more of a transaminitis or cholestatic pattern of injury. Um, lung, eye, joints, fascia, or GI tract, and genitalia involvement. And this typically onsets around over 100 days post-transplant. So we think a lot about graft-versus-host disease prevention as well. Um, donor selection is the first step in minimizing that degree of HLA mismatch between donor and recipient. Um, but we also use a slew of medications. We very commonly use calcineurin inhibitors, including cyclosporin and tacrolimus. These block the T-cell signaling activation cascade. Um, we do require pretty close monitoring to ensure patients are receiving therapeutic and safe levels. Um, we also use anti-metabolites, including Celsept and methotrexate. These block pro proliferation of active lymphocytes. And then post-transplant cyclophosphamide, or PT-CY, this is given on day plus three and day plus four following stem cell transplant. And it suppresses allo-reactive T cells and supports the development of regulatory T cells. And one important difference in conditioning regimens that contain PT-CY is that we withhold all immunosuppression until after the PT-CY is given, as this allows the donor T cells to recognize the host. And um, the T cells that are reacting at this point are the T cells that are thought to cause graft-versus-host disease down the line. Um, so we allow them to proliferate at first, and then we knock them down with the PT-CY. Um, after patients have received the PTCI, we start our normal immunosuppression combinations with like 
tacrolimus or um, cyclosporin. Um, so one important complication in these types of regimens that do contain cyclophosphamide um, is cytokine release syndrome. So like I said, all immunosuppression is withheld until after PTCI is given on day plus four. During this time frame, those allo-reactive T cells are proliferating, they're recognizing a lot of non-self, and um, they can induce a systemic inflammatory response known as cytokine release syndrome. This is characterized by fever and can be associated with hypotension and hypoxia and more severe manifestations. Um, there's a higher incidence in patients that have greater degrees of HLA mismatch. So we give PTCI to haploidentical donors, of course, but um, also are finding it to be useful in mismatched unrelated, matched unrelated, or even match-related donor scenarios. So um, match-related donor is still at risk of developing CRS post-transplant since there's no immunosuppression on board, but much lower incidence. And then management is focused around supportive care, um, but we can also give targeted immunosuppression with tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 blockade if necessary. And this allows us to treat the inflammation caused by these T cells without altering the donor cell susceptibility to cyclophosphamide. So Ms. Gertrude, she ends up developing a fever on day plus one of her haplotransplant with PTCI. She has an infectious workup performed that's unrevealing. She was started on cefepim for neutropenic fever. 12 hours later, she develops a recurrent fever, and she's now requiring one liter of supplemental oxygen, where previously she was stable on room air. And this is graded as grade two CRS. Um, she's treated with tocilizumab and has resolution of her fever and hypoxia. Just a brief note on life after transplant, disease relapse is the main cause of treatment failure in the first two to four years following stem cell transplant. Other causes of late death include chronic graft versus host disease, organ failure, or secondary cancers, which occurs in about five to 10% of patients who survive over two years. However, patients who do not relapse have relatively high rates of survival, around 80% at 10 to 20 years post-transplant. And this is a um, representation of our transplant outcomes over time here at CU. As you can see um, throughout the years, our transplant outcomes have continued to improve. This is probably related to improvements in transplant medicine. Um, and it's pretty cool to see that, you know, we've been able to improve this much in a matter of years for this, these previously incurable diseases. It's um, changing all the time and it's very exciting to see where this will go. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Any questions? When you see patients in the hospital and they get bone marrow, they've had a bone marrow biopsy pretty quickly right before transplant. Do you guys always know those results when they go into transplant? Like if they're in remission, if they're if there's minimal residual disease or all the details of that? I've always been curious. Um, I think we'll definitely at least know like a morphologic results. You know, if there's a send out MRD PCR, that's going to take two weeks to get back. Maybe we won't know. And that might impact whether or not we decide to put patients on like a post-transplant maintenance medication, um, possibly. But yeah, whenever we're admitting, I always double check all of the pathology and make sure. So you never know. Sometimes patients come from outside facilities and we you have to acquire all the records um, from outside biopsies and whatnot. So, but yeah, very important to ensure patients are in a remission prior to transplant. We did have one scenario where a patient had admitted for transplant and found to have blasts on their peripheral smear. So it had to quickly change plans. Um, but that's a very rare scenario. Um, I'll just follow that up with, I noticed on some of your graphs that there was that haplo cord transplant as well, which the combination of the haplo and the cord. And I was just wondering if you could speak to why we might prefer that kind of transplant over just a cord alone or just a haplo alone. Yeah, that's a great question. So a haplocord, um, it gives us kind of benefit of both worlds. So haploidentical transplants are able to engraft much faster um, and there's lower rates of infection due to shorter periods of prolonged neutropenia. Um, but the cord is associated with lower rates of graft versus host disease. So when we give a combination like that, we are benefiting from the faster rates of engraftment that haploidentical um, donor will engraft first. And then we'll see kind of almost like a second engraftment of the cord fighting off the haploidentical donor. 
and will become the prime, hopefully and ultimately will become the primary um, donor stem cell source going forward. So patients are able to hopefully have lower GBHD um, longitudinally. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, so the advent of post-transplant sci is something that kind of came around after I had mainly left inpatient medicine. So I was just hoping maybe you could explain the decision-making process by which you decide to give TOSI, um, cause that's just not something I'm all, I know it's something that we routinely do now, but it's not something I'm all that familiar about how you come to that decision. Yeah. Um, any, any CRS that reaches grade two or higher, basically we'll give TOSI for. So if they're just having isolated fevers, we'll just do infectious workup and give treat new, uh, empirically for neutropenic fever. Um, however, if they develop hypoxia or hypotension associated with their fever, we'll still treat them for infection, but assume that this is probably related to their um, cytokine release syndrome and give TOSI and it clears symptoms up. It'll clear fever up and um, any other associated symptoms up very quickly. And then the risk for cytokine release syndrome is also a very short window. After patients get that second dose of PT psi, we no longer consider them at risk. The um, the infl inflammation that's being caused by those T cells has been wiped out. Great. Any other questions? Lauren, that was a really great talk. You pretty much hit all of the important parts of transplant, the process, and the management. Um, I, I did like, you know, one of your last graphs, which showed the progression and the improvement over time uh, related to. Um, you know, the outcomes for allogeneic stem cell transplant. And, you know, I think there are probably a lot of factors that go into that, but I think, you know, certainly here at the University of Colorado, having, you know, uh, NPs and PAs on our team like you who are responsible for taking care of these patients on a day-to-day -day basis, I think has made a uh, dramatic improvement in the care we provide these patients and their outcomes. So 